volume of peripheries, which means it's also our fifth anniversary, which seems very significant. Mm. <laughs> um, I'm really grateful to serve as the editor-in-chief for another year, and I just want to thank a few people. I want to thank Harry, especially. Yes, Harry. Yes, mm -hmm. Harry, for um, making everything work all year long, to Jake, who is our designer and produces this beautiful book. And to the rest of the editors, a lot of whom are here, Emma, Eden, Alex, Ben, um, Eden especially for giving me the courage at the beginning of this project to make this into something really exciting. And I want to thank also the Centre for the Study of World Religions, who support us in the Harvard Divinity School, and Grolia for this very sweet relationship um, that started. And, and for our contributors, some of whom are sitting here and going to give us a little taste of what's in the journal, and um, a sense of the breadth of this uh, volume. So some of you might know that each year we do a folio on a special topic and we get, get guest editors to um, collate um, a, a collection. This year our topic has been um, well, a folio of musical events and this includes, includes scores and um, poets who are thinking about music and composing alongside music. Uh, the journal begins and the folio begins with um, some archival material from John Ashbury archive here. And I want to thank John Ashbury Estates for giving us permission to publish the material. Um, and then you've got 24 artists who are working between sound, word, and image, and musical scores with visual and linguistic elements that invite readers to perform. And I suppose I was thinking that a poem is similar to this in that. Um, it comes alive when someone reads it and performs it. And so I guess that's what we're doing here tonight. And I'm going to keep my introductions really short because we've got six people who have generously given their time to come and read and perform for you. First up, we have Martha Collins, who is one of the local areas and the country's most beloved poets. She founded the Creative Writing program at UMass, yes, mm -hmm. and I think has published 10, 11, 11, I think it was going to be 11, <laughs> <laughs> books of poetry, and translates Vietnamese poetry as well, and is the recipient of too many awards for me to mention, it'll take all night. Um, thank you, to my neighbors, April, May, 2020. One, hey, you red tulip, anthers turn, pistol, plump, good job. Can you hear me, or should I be back here? Back here? Is this better? Is the mic better? Is the mic better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Should I start over? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Talking to my neighbors. Oh, yeah. April, <laughs> April May 2021. Hey, you red tulip, anthers turned, pistol thumped. Good job. Two. Lucky dogs who get to take your humans for longer walks. Three. Deep purple iris, not quite open, but I know what's inside. Mm -hmm. 
sorry weeds, but you'll succeed in spite of me. Five. So green, so fast, so many greens. Sycamore, it's time. Six. And you're not safe in here. Seven. Music here. Cardinal, thanks for the wolf whistle, the red suit for letting me come so close. Eight. Azalea crowds of pink, scarlet, white, no distancing for you. Nine. Squirrel chases, pigeon chases, rabbit chases, squirrel, pigeon, rabbit. Ten. Got my attention to the tree, yellow, orange, green flowers plopping on pavement. Eleven. Slow down, cars. Squirrel imprinted on street. Crushed dove. Twelve. Wind, you're everywhere. No wonder we say breath of God. No wonder. So now I will turn to my 11th book, uh, which is still kind of a baby book. It's two months old. It's called Casualty Reports. Um, and two of the sections in this poem focus on coal. Um, the first of those sections is about my family, my grandfather and great-grandfather, the coal miners. But I'll read from uh, the second section, uh, taking us not only to our relationship with other not human creatures, creatures, but also our non-human ancestors. Grave. It is all, all over the earth, under earth, a graveyard. Tree ferns, trees, roots, bark, seeds, ancient life that emerged from the sea. Forests flooded to swamps and bogs, transformed to peat, transformed again, sunk covered with layers of earth, with strange amphibian, snake, and later dinosaur bones. Layers and layers, and under it all, for hundreds of millions of years, our ancestors resting under earth, overburdened, we say, until we found them. burning. The mercury, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides from burning coal that fill our air and fall upon us as acid rain. The selenium, arsenic, lead from coal ash stored in coal ash ponds that leak and spill and pollute our waters. But most of all, the carbon dioxide released by burning that captures heat, that warms our air and melts our glaciers, lifts our seas and warms them, dries our land and fuels fires, strengthens rainfalls and hurricanes that swell our waters and generate floods, all of which threaten our coasts and cities, our islands and whole nations, consume our animals, plants, insects, and fish, whole species, including most likely our own, unless we, unless. And the last of these coal poems, and then I'll read one other. Blessing. Where we dug up the graves of black slaves who mined the first coal in Illinois. Where we desecrated the graves of indigenous people that covered coal in the Southwest. Where we dug up animals, plants in their graves and burned them as oil and gas and coal. There and throughout our earth, let us grieve for the graves we robbed and then let us bless the graves of the dead that remain and over them for the living, the wind, the sun. There's um, one section of casualty reports, which is about the casualties of war, and I'll end with one of these. Um, another kind of blessing. 
Um, it was written some years ago for Gaza. I read it with Gaza in mind, but also with Ukraine in mind. For Gaza. For the woman who cooks on a fire of sticks and boards beside her shell of a house, her bag of clothes in a tree. For physician Aniel Jeru, his wife cut in half, his year old son turned to pieces. For the 30 dead Samuni family members dug out of the rubble, for the living, including children who clutched dead mothers. For the schools and mosques and homes destroyed by bombs, for the graves disturbed by chains. For the more than 1,300 dead, including those who walked from their homes as directed with white flags. For those going home to water their trees, lemon and almond and olive, and for those trees. Thank you. magazine would um, look like, and it's so beautiful. Uh, all of you at home, look how beautiful it is. <laughs> it's got pictures and uh, all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's from the Harvard Divinity School, so it's sort of sacred <laughs> <laughs> some sort. Um, so I used to read the two poems that are in this, um, they're in this. I'm totally messing up. There we go. <clears throat> This one's called Krakow. Uh, this is, it's for Adam Zagievsky, who I got to teach with for quite a few years down in Houston. Wonderful Adam Zagievsky. Uh, it's, it's so great to be at the, at the Corolio, too. I, I would come here when I was like in my 20s, and just, it's just sort of this mythical place until the music would accuse you of shoplifting. <laughs> <laughs> Which I never did. I never stole a book from Corolio. Other places. <laughs> Drive to steal poetry books. Steal other books. Krakow. I thought I'd come to the end of something, but the end is not a place you visit. It's not a train you either get off or stay on. It spreads outward from wherever you find yourself. The summer Blade Runner was re released. I watched it on an enormous screen left over from the communist era. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. I wasn't eating meat, but I'd lost the words for vegetables. I go to milk bars and just point. Spinyak, zemnyak, kawa. I waited in line to buy a can of something from a grocery store. A smiling girl on the label. Some words I couldn't read. I placed it in the center of my empty room and imagined what was inside. 
If I never opened it, it could be anything. The girl in the label could be inside, or a key to another room, or a series of smaller cans, each with its own mystery on the label. It might never end. Sometimes you go to the well, and the well is empty. Sometimes you turn in the faucet, and nothing comes. You have a choice. Drink the nothing, or wait a little longer. I missed my train to Oswiso, but caught the next one. At sundown, I wandered the ruins and thought a blackberry growing from a pile of ash. Holy, I thought, but could never find a way to get inside it. And, and so there, there, that was the first poem. This is my last poem. <laughs> there's no middle. There's no middle to this reading. There's only a beginning and an end. Uh, <laughs> This one's, this one's shorter, too, so uh, you got to pay attention. Uh, it's called For the Love of God, uh, and it has a little epigraph. Uh, the epigraph is from a newspaper article. I, have, I had a little photograph for a long time. I cut from the newspaper, which was uh, a skull, a human skull encrusted with diamonds. And it, the caption said, Damien Hurst encrusted a human skull with 8,601 diamonds and called it For the Love of God. For the Love of God. By now, we've seen enough of that oblivion to know it works. A switch we can rely on. Off, on, on, off. When I say by now, I mean when I was 13. The year girls became the switch. On, on, on. We didn't have dimmers, so the closer to arrival we got, the more real it seemed. A possession we could give ourselves to. Love. It has taken so long to find each other, to get inside, as if each of us were a cave or a place to return to. Your teeth will last forever now, all our teeth will, as white as the day we fell. For the love of God, even our eye sockets glitter. Thank you. in the compositional process, um, that one, from the point of having an idea in one's mind to uh, all those steps involved to performance of the piece, how, um, how that idea has changed and morphed and um, not the same. So this composition and the series of compositions um, takes a text, and it's usually a specifically chosen text, 
and that text provides cues for sound. Um, so the kind of miscommunication that I am focusing on with this translation project is um, understood through this process in that the reader, who silently reads a text, um, will have a very different experience. And when uh, these cues are come about in reading the text, sound, they will create a sound or produce a sound. And so the audience or the listeners will have a very different understanding of the text. They'll understand it through these time points, um, which are come upon by the natural reading pace of the reader, and then these cues to make sound. So it's, again, this miscommunication. So I'm going to ask you to help me. I'm going to pass out the scores. I have, I don't know how many people are I will, I will explain the directions, though. Um, So these are the full scores with the stable, and then I think I have just single pages if we run out. Oh, right. Oh, actually, these are fine, too. Okay. So some of the, the ones that have a stapled copy that has the actual directions, and then otherwise you just have the actual uh, text and um, title page. But I'll explain the directions. So this was actually the first of the series that I wrote in 2010. Uh, it was the, uh, coming up on the 100th anniversary, or the 100 year birthday of John Cage, who's very inspirational to a lot of people and to myself. Um, and so this one is called For Page 99. It's the first of the series. Um, so what I'll have you do is there's a text on the back which starts the white paintings, caught whatever fell on them. Um, and above that, or if those have those people with directions, you'll see actually all these written out. But above that, you'll see a series of words and symbols, I, and, it, the, to, its, period, comma, and question mark. And what I'll have you do is each, on, at your own pace, silently read this text. And first, you'll choose one of these symbols or words at the top. When you come to one of these, so I'll choose I, for example, when I come to the word I, I will stop reading, pause for a moment, and I will sing uh, any pitch. I'll sing on the word ah, so ah, or ah, whatever pitch comes to mind. It doesn't have to be pretty. We'll keep it quiet, though. <laughs> um, and when you finish singing your ah, then you'll resume reading. And the next time you come to that word or symbol, you'll sing again. Any pitch doesn't have to be the same. Um, I haven't done this with a group. I'm assuming we're writers and poets here. And I haven't done that. But I have done it with non-musicians many times. So, <laughs> so that's fine. Um, yeah, I usually do a vocal warm-up first. But we, we don't have to do that. Um, so once you finish, let's say you've chosen the word I and you finish the text, um, then you'll go back and you'll choose a different word or a different symbol and you'll silently read again and follow the same process. When you come to that word or symbol, you'll stop make a sound uh, or pitch, and then you'll resume reading. So we start with, we choose it. You choose a word or a symbol, one of those along the top, right. yeah. Okay. So and then people will be doing different. So mm -hmm. exactly. But we'll never recite those words or any of the words in the text. It's all silently read, um, except for our song. And I'll mention, so probably many of us know four minutes and four minutes and 33 seconds mm -hmm. of pages. Um, which is his silent piece, but it's of course not silent. And um, this is uh, a work, uh, well, this, this text here is something that Cage wrote about what inspired him to write 433, which was Robert Rauschenberg's white paintings, those three white panels, um, and the reflection that he saw, so it wasn't just white. 
Um, so that's that's the reading here. Um, okay, and I should also add. What is it? Each A pitch was three to twelve. What's that? Three, three to twelve seconds. You okay. Can sing for okay. yeah. Okay. Are you going to sing all of them or or not? Um, I will do the role. same thing that you do. So I'm going to choose a word, oh, and then I'll go through it. And every time I find that word, you to help us or not? <laughs> right, you won't have any help. <laughs> um, but the duration of this is two minutes and two, 23 seconds, which the uh, 433 is actually made up of three movements, like a piano sonata is, premiered by a pianist, um, David Tudor. And the second movement of it is two minutes and 30, 23 seconds. So that's how long this duration is. So I'm going to time this. And when I, let's see, yeah. So I'll just give the cue to start us, and then I'll give the cue to stop us, okay?
That was such an incredibly kind introduction. <laughs> you should hear about Sharon. No, I should, yeah. so <laughs> should understand. So it should introduce her and tell her all the wonderful things that she's done. We should really flip these things inside mm -hmm. out. It's not about the poets and about the audience and stuff. Mm -hmm. So thank you, everyone who was involved. Harry also for putting this together. Everyone who's here tonight. Yes, Harry. <laughs> so much. Yeah, many thanks. Um, this entire book is about fire, and particularly about the phoenix and the capacity to regenerate ourselves after everything that's been happening in our own private, personal lives, but also in the wider collective life. Um, and it's also about trying to recover from an obsession with fire that lasted for many, many years. And it finally uh, changed. At first I thought, oh, after, you know, after you finish a book, you think you never want to see it again. <laughs> You're done with it. It's like a shell or something. But um, I thought, oh, well, fire, you know, maybe I'll, like, I don't know. Are these element poems that are coming? And I didn't know what would be next. And then um, I spent all night in prayer, and I rested my face against the side of a mosque that had letters that I couldn't read on it. And for some reason, at that moment, I realized that actually, if you purify fire, it turns into light. <laughs> things that happened with fire before when I could not speak. I do not know if fire is the correct word. The first was the burning that was inside the girl, then completely separate from her on its own. The second was a flock of birds a flock of skeletons, flaming birds. I was frightened. There were fire marshals signaling, this is illegal, they said. With enormous effort, I prevented myself thinking the thing inside the match that wanted out. And then, because I had to, because the fire could not be prevented, I wrote this. And, fire, and um, Sharon's going to show you uh, a piece that, <laughs> I won't explain it, it's, mm -hmm. it's a ritual, and it's also a poem, and it's also a song. <laughs> Thank you.
She could douse it with a gallon of lighter fluid, light the match. If she could watch like this always, always to watch, never to enter, never to feel the brightness catch and the fabric searing. Like, look how the mattress holds everything the body refuses to keep inside, leak, stain, spot, and mark. But nothing belongs to it. How will she hold herself if she cannot hold both? The exhausting wheel of wounding and healing burns inside the mattress, the suffering burns, the desire to heal again from suffering burns. I don't want to feel, but how could I bear not feeling? She's been floating for years, hovering somewhere above her body, I said. Is this the bed she must enter? Is this where she was conceived in a bed of fire? Wings lifting up, mouth open, calling over the gauze of smoke, the dim orange hum coming and going over them. Did she know what knowing is? As the bed burned from the outside in, black flakes oranging at the edges, then breaking off in pieces to spark out on the sand. Which was the blaze that burned through the outer husk of her? Which seared into the mattress, into every fiber of tissue and flesh, to burn away what she was, what she meant to become? There, where the wound is open, utterly still in its need, so completely still in hunger as the sway of yellows swell and fall over it, swell and fall. The skin of eyelids covering the whole of a body, eyelids all flickering, ready to exist, along the whole horizon of its being, ready to exist, a unified weeping like the emergence of the soul. What do the dead want from us? What is the light of the inside? Light meeting light, like mirror meeting fire. The body of eyes everywhere, a joyful sobbing everywhere, a crackling wash of cries where the glowing coals emerge, just at the center of the fluff of ash and blackened fabric. Last night, I felt the flames climb in at last to the inner core. They found the wire mesh of the mattress twisted in its skeleton of light, its body of glowing gold in the black, joy or anguish to be born in fire, in the elemental moment to feel the flames coursing over my bones, caressing every cell with light until at last the fire bent down low over the rib cage and reaching, reached in. My shattered chest is cold like wire. Heart melted down to a single pore. And that heart melted into the form of the corpus, which wobbled away deeper and more to drop and drop, to shatter into the splendences of grace, scattered as seeds of life and as light rays.
So we've got a sense of the breadth of material and audio visual material in the um, journal. And we've got two more um, readers. Um, we're always on the lookout for new talent. Um, and we take a very small proportion of pieces that are unsolicited and just sent in to us. And we're really excited to read Kyra Mo's um, piece. She's going to read us a prose piece that's published in the journal. something large and shuffled my feet to its left. The underbelly fed me no rubble, the bellow had no mouth, and all that was churning went fast and quiet. Today I stood, stayed still, sure I would be shaken, waiting to quake. On tiptoe I teetered on a far, far away world, but there was no solace under the flat ground, and there is nothing I know. Today, I was still. The sea made me afraid. It crinkled under the sun. It folded, crushed something into current, like this. Your eyes, which crumpled more, still in my paper memory, like this. I do not see the sun that sets for you. And me, unframed in my own view, a light leak. Today, I kicked a river and watched it mourn. The water that returned was enough to fill a sneaker. The water, not enough to be solid. I searched for an ounce of lack, some unnatural displacement to call mine, a small gash of grief in the ground. But the mud had made way. It slipped off a cling of my souls, leaping to the stream. And it all looked about the same. The river, the rubber lining of a shoe, the springing gush. The washed eye, the rinsing, my own unwelcome, the nothings I liquidized in between. Afterwards, standing still on the rounding blink, I thought I was sorry, very sorry, and my freezing foot in its anger was only rueful, and the river retreated before me. A robin flew past my turned back. I wonder what it is to be a body of water because I am not. I think you were endless moving cobalt blue, but today my veins did not feel fluid. I walked and went unreplenished. Today I was the body in water, ankles dipped in a trembling pond, kicking, except I am above ground and dry, dripping. I jumped into the flatness of the ground. The indent stayed a second or two. I did not. I uttered today and wished I hadn't, so I don't. I see my arms now arched with purpose. I draw back a bow with a little green-tipped feather and wish for it to hit, rip a piece of paper, rush a point into the losing air, catch a bullseye, unweathered. Maybe in the morning I'll find its whittling way. For the comets were here today in the living room. They ran a laugh above your hair. I missed you and didn't tell, no. The smooth shell, the undergrowth, the inching. My head bent down, I saw a snail on the pavement, slowing with no regret. I tried to follow, I did. But I lost the trail in a second, or two, and the comments left the hour after, and I fell asleep too fast. I go to take my melancholy one time a day, whenever the water bottle is filled, but today it is all sloshing. So I sit. 
The sneakers have dried now with mud markings shaking, shaken loose. I am showered, water falling, caught at this. I wake up too slow, and the, el and the escalator brings me down with it, and the river forgives me, and the underbelly picks me like a flower from the wet, unrooted dirt, and I am still. In the corner, there is a hulk of powdered cement, a sack of almost permanence, not yet watered to a solid. As if dirt it made a plant grow tall, I imagine a tin can, small and spilling each day in your grasp, a little tree curving its arms, roots making roads for themselves, the curdling cement, the cradle. Today, the pavement cut a white flower from a cleft. I was lost on sidewalks. In rivulets split, I found a white flower. My light leaped. A robin that I didn't see. Body of water, I picked it up. Let it take. I'm ready to lose something, too. For tomorrow, the comets came and went again, again. Tomorrow, there was good ground. I stood with bare feet in the trickle of water, and the flat sea took in a shoe. That was pretty beautifully read. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, my last um, reading for the year. Um, Darius, let it put Peckham. Um, is a friend of ours, <laughs> a dear friend. Um, we have, he's beloved to many of us. We've been in workshops together mm -hmm. and we've watched him become really famous or something. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might be, Darius. And you've published all over the place, I discovered today um, when I Googled this. <laughs> um, I know his um, chat book. Um, how many love poems is probably sold here. You might want to pick up the copy as well. And his poem actually finishes, for a phrase, it's the last poem of the book. We knew it's where we had to end it because, I know it, um, like all of Darius's poems, communicates something of the sweetness and sensitivity and good nature of Darius. And we wanted to leave the book there and leave the reading tonight there too. So, um, hi all, I'm Darius. Uh, I would not call myself famous. <laughs> I would call myself really lucky um, to have you all uh, earlier as well. It's been really good to me this past year, so thank you. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I just, I love you all. <laughs> That's so sweet. Um, yeah, I'm just going to read the poem from, I'm probably like too loud, even without a mic, so sorry. Um, but I, I'm i going to read the poem from Peripheries. Um, this was written during the pandemic, um, in Pandemic Workshop era with Jaron, Alex, and Emma, and Sam, and Ben, and it's just, ah, having you here to, I've never actually read it, I've never read it aloud, so. This is uh, beyond workshop, but I'm excited too, and uh, thank you. Uh, it's called um, Memorial Mural for the Persian Picasso, and it's after um, a documentary called Fifi, Fowl Fifi Howls from Happiness. Uh, it's a really beautiful documentary. I hope the poem gives um, a bit of a sense of it. Uh, Memorial Mural for the Persian Picasso. Begin at the farm, where sullen cows are pimped out $75 a hug to the lonely people. Where I wish to be now, hugging arms spread wide, wrapped around the skin of an animal I eat many weeknights, the smallest hair sprouting human feeling from its skin. Begin in the name of God. Begin with Batman Bohases, old man painter in his apartment in Italy, in his unhumble hermitude, staring at a screen, at an ocean, laughing, 
pointing at his grave. Fine. Begin here. Persian Picasso, chain smoking, preaching sounds in the back of his throat to his desert body as he rises from his chair. Begin with the living, the warm body. Batman returning to Tehran, destroying his masterworks, laughing at the shorn canvas of their faces, explaining how everything has a life, and that these, these are no different. An animal dies while living, a human lives in death. The animal that is within me is dear to my heart. Begin, Fine. And again in Persian, Begu Dobare. Dobare Begu. Again it say, say it when you don't understand. Often I don't understand. Begin at the farm where lonely people are pimped out $75 a hug to sullen cows, wrapped, hooves wrapped around where they wish to be. Begin Batman buying colors in the streets of Italy. No sane artist buys gray, they create gray. Begin muttering Jesus Christ at the neat murder of one praying mantis by another, at the way life ends in the mouths of those closest to you. Keep the lonely things separate. Begin in the underwater, wanting to end, spread like in the ocean. Begin unsure of how I want to spread. Often I am unsure. How do ashes spread unsure in the ocean? A worm has the right to crawl the earth, but I don't have that right. And the pigs are cute now and will die soon. When I was very young, one peed in my arms on my jacket. Grandma snapped the picture. Look, see, if we just, Batman began dying in the middle of his own documentary, spiting immortality, begin with the cow arms wrapped around the lonely people, smiling, begin anywhere I, you, begin. The other day, a bug flew past my shoulder. And out of instinct, I swear it was indistinct, I swatted it to the cement and I thought I killed it. I felt despair, thought, why did you do that? You didn't need to do that. Fine. Until it righted itself, spread its wings, re-entered the garden, and I wanted to shout. Remember my father scooping up a stink bug in tissue paper at my command, crunching it in my ear so that I'd feel the shiver of its last breaths at my neck for the rest of the night. You need to learn to do this yourself. I feel a thrill. They begin to wrap it up. The Persian Picasso's life's work strung up like meats. Sell the paintings he promised he'd destroy, color, bleeding, and all that cardboard. Begin now, just Persian Picasso. Begin trudging back to the farm cottage on the hill near the singing brook, settling up with the stars. So many fish spreading, swimming in the green blue. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, let's give the poets another round of applause. For We have the journal for sale. Um, if everyone could please help move uh, the chairs back against that wall, and the poets will be signing the journal. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>
Thank you. 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 Thank